The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed. Old Brooklyn Christian in church gospel for i am not ashamed of the gospel and this message came to me when i saw the recent movie that was based on a true story that i'm not ashamed and uh, for those of you raise your hand if you've seen that movie if you heard about it it's uh, a christian movie uh called i'm not ashamed and in this movie it is a true story about the columbine shooting and a lot of people uh didn't realize that the people that were uh killed were targeted uh christians they were targeted Christians in Columbine, um, and a lot of people uh, gave up their life for the name of Christ. And uh, the, one, the one lady that was uh, one of the main people in the movie was uh, Rochelle, Rachel, and uh, she gave up her life uh, for Jesus. And I like the way that they portrayed the movie. It was about a woman who had real struggles. You know, sometimes as Christians, we become fake and phony and we act like we don't ever go through any struggles as a Christian. You're going to go through struggles one way or another. You're going to go through temptations. You're going to backslide. You're going to go through all types of challenges. But how many know that you can overcome in God? Amen. Amen. And she did overcome to the end. And sometimes uh, by losing your life, you affect a lot of lives. And she affected a lot of people when she gave up her life, you know, to the point that I'm talking about it today, you know. And I remember when Columbine took place and those uh, children were killed, assassinated in the school. I wasn't even a Christian back then. And the whole story really didn't have an uh, impact on me the way that it does now. You know, you look at things differently when you're a Christian versus before Christian. So the, the lady behind me, uh, her name is Hannah. and She's a friend of me and my wife's, and she lives out in California. She has a big outreach ministry um, for her and her family. And one of the things that she does is she will go to all the major events, and she will stand there with some type of a Christian sign. This one says, your neighbor created in the image of God. And this woman, she's a very, very tiny, petite woman. She maybe weighs about 80 pounds. She's five foot two, but she stands like she's 12 foot tall and 500 pounds. She's bold as a lion. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. If people reject the gospel, we still have to give them an opportunity. You hear that? If people reject the gospel, we still have to give them an opportunity. In other words, we have to share it with them anyways, right? There are people that God knows that they're going to reject it, they're not going to receive it, but yet God still gives them an opportunity. Amen. How many of us like an opportunity? Amen. Amen. Believe me, everyone is going to want an opportunity at one point in time. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 54, it says, When he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence has this man's wisdom and these mighty works? So here, this is Jesus, right? Sharing the word of God with people in the synagogue, and they began to question him because they knew him. Right? They knew about his background. They knew his father was a carpenter. They knew his mother. They, they, maybe even they went to school with him. And so because of that, they started to question, who is he to share the gospel with me? And I'm going to tell you, there's going to be people that went to school with you, people that know about your history, people that know about your past. And when you share the truth with them, they're going to sometimes use your past against you. They're going to use the relationship that you once had against you and the question is are you still going to be willing to share the gospel with them or are you going to become ashamed they started to identify the humanity of Jesus oh because now he's a carpenter how could he be this great person but he was he was for I am not ashamed of the gospel we have to become unreserved when it comes to family and friends. Sometimes the people that know you personally are the hardest people to minister to. 
Does everyone know the word unreserved? Reserved means that you're holding back. Reserved means that you're withholding something. You're regimenting something. You're holding something. You're, you're not giving it totally. You're keeping it from. But unreserved means the opposite of that. It means that you're not willing to hold anything back. You want to give it your all. And that's how we should be when it comes to sharing the gospel. Amen? And, and I want to encourage you. You know, I shared a whole entire sermon called You're Making a Difference. A lot of times we feel like we're not going to make a difference. Or what, what can we say? We don't have all the credentials or the experience. Or we don't have all the gifts. And who are we to make a difference? You're a soul. And all you need to be is a sincere one. And a willing one. And then God will do the rest. Amen. Amen. God will do the rest. All you have to be is sincere and willing. Yeah. So when it, becomes, when it comes to our family and friends, we have to learn to be unreserved. In Matthew 13, 55, he says, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not this the mother called Mary? And his brothers, James and, and Jose and Simon and Judas and his sisters, and are not they all with us? Whence had this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works because of their unbelief. Now it doesn't say that he didn't do any works and miracles. It just says that he didn't do many because the people didn't believe. Now check this out. These people did not believe in Jesus because they knew him. They rejected the gospel. They rejected the message. The question that I ask you today is, did Jesus already know that they were going to reject him? Did Jesus already know that they would not be able to see past his history? Did Jesus already know that? And then if he did already know that, why did he still share the gospel with them? See, there are people in your life that you know for a fact they're not going to want to hear nothing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're not going to want to hear anything about church. And you know when you mention it, they're going to hang up on you. They're going to reject you. But guess what? Jesus still gave it to them anyways, knowing that they were going to reject it. He, he didn't hold back. See, Sometimes we have to be willing to plant a seed in an unconventional lot. It might not look like anything's going to grow. It might not look like there's going to ever be any sunshine. It might look like there's never going to be any water. But we still have to be willing to be unreserved and plant the seeds anyway. Because you know what? It's not our duty or responsibility of what happens after the seed is planted. It's not our burden. It's not our calling. It, in the gifts of the gospel, it doesn't say uh, some are gifted in preaching, some in gifted or teaching, and then others are gifted in making the seeds grow. It doesn't say that. But it does say that we are to sow. That we are to share it unreserved. Amen? Amen. And, and I'm going to tell you, you'll be surprised that things will grow. That you, even with your lack of faith in certain people, God will shock you. He'll shock you. You know, I remember when I was a young, young child, I remember eating a peach in my, at my grandma's house right on Wichita and Pearl, right, right down the street from here. And I remember taking this peach and eating it and just throwing the seed on the ground. Right? I didn't, I didn't dig the dirt. I didn't uh, uh, chop up the soil and uh, rototill it. I didn't put any fertilizer. I didn't use the sun. I didn't put light on it. I didn't water it. In fact, I just threw the seed out there, the peach seed, and I totally forgot about it. Ten plus years later, there was a peach tree there. 
<laughs> what? How? Why? I wasn't even trying. I didn't do anything other than litter in my grandma's backyard. And boom, a peach tree came. And guess what? It's still there to this day. Amen. So I want to encourage you, share the gospel. Don't worry about people rejecting you. If they rejected Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of God, if they rejected him, guess what, folks? They're going to reject you too. But you have to be walking by faith, not by sight. You have to be willing to share it anyways. And, and in this story, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. In a true story, uh, Rachel gave up her life for the gospel. The, and and the, the armed men, they came in with their guns, planning on killing m way more people than they killed. And they put the gun to her and said, Now, tell me, where's your God? Are you still going to believe in your God to save you? And she, and she, they said, are you going to reject Jesus, deny him? And she said, no. I will not deny him. I will never deny him. And they literally killed her. They took her out. She lost her life. And before that happened, she wrote this, this, she drew this picture of an eye with 13 tears. And in these 13 tears, the teacher said, I can see you becoming something great. You're going to have a great future. And she said, that's strange because I can't see myself getting married. I can't see myself graduating college. I can't see myself having kids. I don't see any future at all. I, I just can't see it. And she said, well, what do these 13 tears represent? She said, I don't know. I don't know. But maybe one day I will know. And 13 tears is exactly 13 people that were killed in Columbine. And you know, that's how God works. He gave this woman a prophetic dream about what was going to happen in the future, had no idea what it is. See, a lot of times God will have you to do things that you don't even know what you're doing. You don't know why you're doing it, but God has a reason. Amen. He has a reason why you're doing the things that you're doing. It might not be obvious right away, and a lot of times with God, it's not obvious right away. Right. And a lot of times, the more... The less obvious it is, the less you understand what you're doing, sometimes the greater God is glorified when it is revealed in his timing. Amen. And this woman, she would go and she would share the gospel with strangers. She shared the gospel with a homeless person. But then when it came to her boyfriend, when it came to her boyfriend, her lover. She became ashamed to tell the gospel. She would minister to everyone at church, strangers, but not her own boyfriend. And then the homeless person that, that she kind of led to the Lord and led to church, he asked her, have you invited your boyfriend to church? And she didn't have an answer for that. She couldn't say anything. But you invited me. See, she became ashamed. And this is what I like about this story is that it's reality. You know, sometimes we do good in certain areas of our life, but then in other areas we hold back. And eventually it came out that the one woman that she was ashamed of, he ended up rejecting her anyways. He ended up cheating on her. He ended up lying to her. He ended up causing her the most amount of pain. The one that she was willing to be ashamed of the gospel with, the one that she was willing to hold back the truth with, the one that she was willing to negotiate and compromise her walk with God with, became the one who caused her the most pain. There's a lesson in that, I believe. There's a lesson in that. 
We need to be as bold as a lion to be effective in his kingdom. You hear that? We have to be as bold as a lion in order to be effective in his kingdom. What does that mean? I shared, I don't know if it was Thursday, that if you're trying to sell something to someone, but you're not even convinced yourself that it has any value, people are not going to buy it. The greatest salespeople are the ones who actually believe in the product that they're selling. Do you hear that? How many want to purchase something from someone that doesn't even believe in what they're selling you? You know, I'll go to a car lot and I'll ask about cars and how great they are. And the salesman will tell me, it's the greatest car in the world. I don't want to start offending the church because I don't know what type of vehicles you guys drive. But there was a certain manufacturer of a certain car and I went there and uh, they were saying how great these cars are. How awesome they are. How dependable they are. And then I said, what kind of car do you drive? And it was not the one that they were selling. Don't you think actions speak louder than words? See, if you're so confident in what you're selling, how come it's not working for you? How come you're not using that? See, if you're working the gospel and living the word of God, you're going to have a confidence in it. You're going to have a confidence in it, and you're going to be able to make great gain. Great gain. And, and you know what? If you're not there yet and you're struggling, then the people that you minister to, be real with them. Tell them, hey, look, I'm still struggling myself. I'm still trying to figure this thing out myself. I'm still working with God myself. He's still not done with me yet. He's still working on me. Amen. People respond more to that. Hey, this product is great, but I'm still working out the kinks. Sometimes the brakes don't work. <laughs> Just be real. At least they can prepare for that, you know. Put an extra seatbelt on. Make sure those, those airbags are working. We need to be as bold as a lion to be effective in his kingdom. And it says in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8, and it says, They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So in other words, they were fine with God 24-7, had no trouble with God up until the point that they sinned, up to the point that they disobeyed God. Now all of a sudden when they sinned and they disobeyed God, now all of a sudden they are ashamed. They're ashamed. And now when God comes around, they hide themselves. See, a lot of times when people don't want to come to church, it's because they're ashamed of the sin. They're ashamed of the life that they're living, and therefore they hold back from God. See, doing prison ministry all to the glory of God for 12 years, I learned a lot of people in jail, they would come up to me, I wouldn't ask them anything, I'd be going into where we're going to do church, and they would come up to me, out of whatever reason, and they would say, Rev, I would love to come to church, but I'm not right yet. I have to first get right, and then I'll come to church. How many times have I heard that over and over and over? I have to first get right. So they're acknowledging that they're not right, and they said, I don't want to be fake with God. I want to be real with God, but I'm not right yet. And after I get right, then I'll go to church. But can I tell you, without God, you'll never be right. Amen. And if you could get right without God, we would not need God. And then I would share that with them and they'd say, well, I guess I'm just not ready yet. And then when you come down to it, what are they saying? They're saying, I'm not willing to choose to give up my other love. But can I tell you, if that other love is not God, that love will eventually destroy you. It will. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I want to tell you, I, I'm, I'm no uh, prophet, but I'm no dummy either. I know that we struggle in this flesh. I know that we struggle in life. But don't let that struggle cause you to be ashamed of the gospel. Don't let that struggle cause you to hide from the Lord. In fact, 
This is what God wants us to do. Like the prodigal son who he wasted all of his inheritance. He, he squandered everything. He lived with the pigs. He ate with the swine. But then he realized, I was doing better with my father. And he ran back to the Lord. And it says that the Lord met him halfway. So you don't have to go the whole way on your own. Meet the Lord halfway. Meet him halfway. Make an effort. And then the Lord, did he beat him? Did he mock him? No, he celebrated him. He gave the best that he had. Lamb chops, I believe. <laughs> Probably with that mint jelly. The Bible doesn't say that, but I'm assuming God knows how to do it right. So he probably had that little mint jelly to dip in. And then the brother was jealous. <laughs> Bear with me, Deacon. I'm, I'm working over here. Amen. <laughs> in Hebrews 4.16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly, boldly unto the throne of Grace. Because guess what? We all need grace, folks. Amen. We all need grace. That we may obtain mercy. We all need mercy. And find grace to help in the time of need. But let's be bold about it, folks. Don't be let. oh, I don't know if I should come to church today. I, you know what? Come! Amen. When I first started going to church... You know what? You, you, you have all types of struggles, all types of battles. When I first started pastoring, you won't believe this, folks, but the first person that came to church, and it was only one person that came, he was high on crack cocaine. But he came to church high as a kite on crack. Not smoking a little bit of uh, marijuana. Not had a couple brewskis in him but he was smoking crack and the Lord said preach Amen. preach to him and I did but you know what he could have just kept doing what he was doing see you're never ever going to give free Amen. keep your boldness because our boldness is not in how great we are our boldness is not in our good works our confidence is not in self. Our confidence and our boldness lies in Jesus Christ and what he did for the world and how much he loved us and the power of him and through the Holy Spirit to be able to give us liberty, to be able to break and destroy yokes and from the word of God that's sharper than a two-edged sword that will defeat anything that the devil brings. Any bondage, any curse, any addiction, it doesn't hold a Handle to God. Amen. Remember that. Remember that. Never quit. Never give up. <laughs> Keep your boldness and go to the throne of grace. In Proverbs 28 verses 1 it says, The wicked man flee when no man pursueth. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. So when you're giving the gospel... Sometimes we'll hold back because we know we've sinned. We know we fall short from the glory of God. That's why God allows us to repent, to ask for forgiveness. Get it right with God and move forward Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. Move forward. We cannot let our past hinder our kingdom service. You hear that? We cannot let our past hinder. Does everyone know the word hinder? That means to stop or to regiment or to restrict. We cannot let our past hinder our kingdom service. That means serving God. Serve God anyway. In Mark chapter 16, verses 9, it says, When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. 
she went and told those who had been with him who were mourning and weeping. And when they heard that Jesus was alive, look at this, folks. When they heard Jesus was alive and that she had seen them, they did not believe her. Why? Because they knew that she used to have demons in her. She knew that she would, they knew that she was unclean. They knew that she was, at one point in time, an uncredible person. They knew that she was possessed. But guess what? Did she let her past stop her from sharing about the gospel? Did she let her past struggles and her past failures slow her down? No, what does it say? It says she rose up early on the first day. And she told them anyways that Jesus was alive. She told them, said they didn't believe her, but she told them anyways. I want to encourage you to tell them anyway. Some may believe, some may not. And you know what I found out through personal experience, folks? Excuse me, one moment. What I found out through personal experience is that 95% of the time, we think people are going to reject us. We think people are not going to receive our faith in Jesus. But 95% of the time, in my experience, they do. They do. Very rarely do people actually say, oh, I don't want nothing to do with God. And I don't, you, usually people don't do that. Even atheists, Muslims, unbelieving people, they don't really act that way most of the time. But in our mind, we're so afraid that people are not going to receive us and they're going to reject us and they're not going to take it. So we never try. But most of the time, they're waiting for someone. See, God will put people in your life that they're, they're waiting for something. They're looking for something already. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of people on the world, what they're doing, guess what? It's not working anyways, and you know that. So you have the answers and the kingdom in your hand because you know Jesus. He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand, which means it's right now. The day of the Lord is today. Amen. Guess what, folks? God is not ashamed of us. I want you to think about that for a second. If you ever feel like there's a time where I should hold back in my walk with God, I should tone it down a little bit. Simmer down. Don't be too fanatical. Don't be too much on fire for God. Don't take your walk with God too extreme. He took his walk extreme for us. Amen. He's not ashamed of us. When we fail, when we fell short, when we messed up, He's not ashamed of us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In Hebrews eleven fifteen, it says, And truly if they had been mindful that country from whence they had came out of, they might have had an opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared for them a city. God's not ashamed to be called our God. Let's give the Lord a hand clap for that. He's not ashamed to be called your God. He's not ashamed of you. He knows about all the things we've done in secret. He knows about all the things that we've done in dark. And he's still not ashamed to be called our Old God. Old Brooklyn Christian Church, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recover of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed old brooklyn christian church <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.